legend when I'm in the city. Wall Street in the ghetto with me, running for freedom. Voice of the people, he never gonna leave me. All my life, wanted to be an American legend. Look at me, look at me. American legend, all this time. Wanted to be an American legend. Look at me, look at me. American legend. American legend, American legend. American legend, American legend. American legend, American legend. American legend, American legend. My first day 25. Welcome to the American Business Podcast. I'm your host, President. I am extremely blessed. We are extremely blessed today to have one of the forefathers of uh, of modern American impact investing, the illustrious, the honorable James Rosebush. Thank you, Michael. It's an honor for me to be with you. Well, well, I uh, I wanted to bring you on to this podcast because, quite frankly, you've had a you've had a an impact on my life in just a, a, the brief period of time that I've gotten, uh, I've gotten connected with you. And I really thought that it's important to share our connection uh, for, for several reasons. The first and foremost, you being a man of faith, me being a man of faith in terms of the lowest common denominator and being men of faith, it is impossible to know how God's gonna bless you and as I've said, and, and, and for the viewers, uh, I'm just going to give a brief recap of, uh, of Mr. Rosebush's bio, but he came from uh, Flint, Michigan, uh, first and foremost. That's correct, right? Correct. So when, when most people think of Flint, we think of magic, we think of the pollution in the water, but this is another add to that, so I would have never guessed that. And then he went from Flint, Michigan, uh, he ultimately ended up becoming an advisor in the White House in the early 1980s with President Ronald Reagan. And that's correct as well, right, sir? Correct. And then in his work in the White House, he transitioned into being a leader in corporate philanthropy, as well as impact investing from Washington, D.C. to the rest of the world. Now, is that correct, sir? Yes. And we were fortunate enough to be connected through a, a, a great colleague in New York, uh, Iva Kaufman, she said, look, you got to meet James. When you meet Mr. Rosebush, you, you'll, really, you'll really vibe. And again, you know, in a very short period of time that we've connected, this man has been a big blessing. And uh, he actually recently released a book. It's called Winning Your Audience, uh, Communicating Your Message Like a President. I actually read the book. Uh, I had the audio version, and, uh, and I actually read through it. And I want to say that uh, as someone that is preparing to speak to the world, for the rest of my life, some of those principles in that book and, and the confidence in terms of demystifying how uh, President Reagan, especially who's known as the great communicator, was able to convey his messages and other great leaders from the Dr. Kings and on were able to convey their messages and making that bite-sized and palatable for someone that may not necessarily see themselves have the confidence of being a great speaker, but aspires to is something that Mr. Rose Bush is in the forefront of so we'd love for you to get into just your, a bit more about your context, about, about your background and fill in some of the blanks. I know I give the people a high level overview, but, but tell them how this guy from, uh, from Flint, Michigan ends up being a world's foremost authority on public speaking. Well, thank you so much, Michael. And it, right back at you, it's a blessing for me to have met you. I appreciate Iva bringing us together because we do connect on many different issues and many different levels and I uh, consider you a real brother so thank you for sustaining that relationship you you mentioned me having been from Flint Michigan it was interesting as kids right we had a stream near our house and we thought on Monday it would run yellow and on Tuesday it would run red and on Wednesday it would run green and we thought as little kids we thought wow this is a magical stream but of course it was pollution from the automobile plants that were headquartered in Flint. And Flint has this interesting history, of course, of migration from the South and providing people who are moving up from the South opportunities to uh, become educated, to work in factories and accumulate wealth and establish a real uh, middle-class uh, environment, which is very interesting. And after I graduated from college, I had an opportunity to start working for the foundation and 
family office of the founder of General Motors. And his objective was to improve conditions throughout the community. And I was assigned the responsibility of working with the education institutions to help improve how they were actually serving the community. And what I was asked to do after we were taken, by the way, hostage, uh, we had one day, I think it was the fourth day I was at work, we had uh, automatic machine gun fire uh, going through the glass front door of our office. We all dove under our desks and we were there. I was under my desk for about five and a half hours until the SWAT team came and led us all down the fire escape, the back of the building. But the person who was the head of the office said to me three weeks later, I'd like you to start a strategic planning initiative to answer one question. Are we having impact? Are we having impact through what we give and, and donate through our philanthropic foundation? And are we having impact through our investments? Now at that time, Michael, the word impact was only used to describe an impact, a, a, an accident, a head on collision between two cars. Now impact, people had to, to search for in, in terms of philanthropy and investment. What do you mean by impact? So I created algorithms that would help us ascertain whether or not every dollar we were spending and in investing in, in specifically in uh, poverty areas, in areas where there were underperforming schools, where there were tremendous health issues in the community, um, where there were uh, unreported uh, uh, number of non-live uh, births. And I took all of those together and I said, and I still wish we did this today. And I took all of those together and I identified the highest uh, and, and most complicated neighborhoods that really needed to have all of these issues addressed. So that, in other words, we were pouring money into the places that needed to be served and the places that need to have these complicated and, and confounding issues really addressed. So that was the first time that anything like that was done. And I conducted a, a, a meeting, a training meeting, a, uh, you know, policy meeting for the foundation trustees and the staff. And we all began to focus on that way. Little did I know 10 years later, I would be invited into the, to the Reagan White House to start the first White House Office on Impact Investing and Impact Philanthropy. So in, in, in my travel uh, up to the White House, I ran the Standard Oil Foundation and that all, and other foundations and that gave me opportunity to, and I started four schools. I was very, very interested, fixated on why it is that we have underperforming school. Why is it that we're failing uh, young people and they don't even want to go to school because they don't even feel safe in school. And, you know, all of these issues have to be addressed in order to improve the fabric of society for everyone. And if you think that uh, there's a lot said today for good reason about uh, there not being equality in a lot of different areas, but I think few, pe few of these people really understand why we don't have equality. And when you really dig into the issues of education, transportation, uh, education, economic education, all of these things have been lacking. And I, I think these are the things that I'm really interested in because you can talk about uh, all the issues from a surface level, which I think we're doing a lot of today. I think people are trying to dig under these issues, but I like to get behind it and I like to say, what's really going on here? What, what is going on here? Why do we have this lack? So for example, one of the foundations I started was to help turn around the public schools in Washington, D.C. Well, my, my focus was to bring technology, instructional technology into the classroom so that all schools, regardless of where they're located and who attends those schools, those students would have access to using technology to accelerate their, their learning and on an individualized basis. Well, I was basically run out of of, of the schools because there was a lot of resistance, not on the part of teachers or principal, but on the part of the administration and, uh, of, of DC public schools. They, at that time, and they've made a lot of progress since then, but at that time they resisted this. Well, this is what schools in wealthy neighborhoods were getting. 
what I felt that all schools, all students should have access to this. So these are the kinds of things uh, in the White House we worked on, uh, public education, public health, public transportation, uh, all of these areas where the government had been responsible for addressing inequality, had been addressing, uh, for example, in, in the case of, uh, you know, a good, good example would be uh, public housing. So at that time, these massive public housing blocks uh, were being torn down because they were an, ex an experiment in disaster. Housing all these people in these high rises, the conditions, as the municipalities, the housing authorities, they weren't taking care of them. They were rat infested. We still have this in New York City. I think that's intolerable. I think it's inexcusable for any politician to be even be elected and to stay in position when people are inhabiting public housing units that are filled with rats, vermin, and, and rust, rusty pipes, low water quality. What excuse do we have for that? We live in a modern era when we can address this and we can get this, these situations solved. I, if I were a politician and public housing uh, in my jurisdiction was that quality, I'd have to resign and I'd have my tail between my legs. Anyway, they don't, they don't seem to look at it that way. I, I feel that people should be held accountable for how they manage this investment in communities. I think this is absolutely critically important. And uh, that's what we tried to do in this program that I was running in the Reagan White House. And what we were able to accomplish was a whole new model of what is public housing. People deserve to live in fine quality, well-maintained, uh, have basic housing that uh, addresses their needs, but is also maintained in a way that, you know, an, uh, that any person in any family uh, deserves to have. We found going back to my work at the Mott Foundation that we also had to address the issue of employment and employment training on a basic level, because as I could see through my research and my discussions with people in the community, there were a lot of people that weren't even ready to go into job training because they didn't, they, they had no role models in their homes. They had no capacity to say, oh, you need to set your alarm at 6.30 this morning. You need to get up, get dressed, find your way to a job training center. A lot of these people wouldn't, they wouldn't go to job training because they had no role model. Or they had no discipline in their households to say, this is what you have to do. Plus they didn't see what the incentive was to do it. So we had to work on these basic fundamental principles to uplift the whole community and uplift individuals into positions of responsibility and, and better education, better preparation, better training, and to put them in a position to uh, begin to accumulate wealth and to be able to lift their standard uh, of life. And these are the things I think that have to be addressed on a local community level. But I would have to say that politics has gotten in the way of this much more than it has been helpful. And, you know, these are just a few of the things that I've, I've done in my life. I, I've seen that in, uh, for example, I started the first school without walls in Boston called the Learning Guild. And what wasn't just me, but it was a whole group of us were involved in that. And the school department said, first they said, you know, what, what are you talking about? You can't, we want to take kids in the neighborhoods to uh, the fire departments, to the police department, to the museums, uh, to the zoos, all these places, and to have learning modules there because, you know, you it's patently known. You can learn so much more by being out in the world in, in a guided, you know, instructional way than you can sitting in a classroom. And of course, first they were like, oh, are you kidding? There's absolutely no way we're going to allow you to do that. Well, slowly we convinced them and they began to see that you can, uh, you know, in a structured way, and be held accountable for it, you can learn by, by being out in the community and seeing these different community assets and respecting them. And I, I wish that more of that were done today. Another school that I was uh, honored to be the first president of was the Challenger Memorial Foundation. So after the Challenger astronauts went down, the families of the astronauts decided they wanna continue the mission and they wanted kids to be able to learn space science education. So we went into, we created 48 schools around the world uh, that were based in other schools to provide curriculum for kids at, at a young age to sit in front of a, a console and to 
have virtual space science education to go up and to continue the mission to go to go out into space and to give kids an idea that the future is yours. You can do anything with it. It's it, there's an opportunity there for you. You have to break barriers, no question. Every, every kid has to break barriers. All, all, kids kids are confronted today. All all types of kids are confronted with all kinds of barriers. That doesn't mean they can't be broken. And we have great role models that show it. But anyway, I'll, I'll stop there. You may have some questions, uh, but I, I can also tell you a little bit about why all of those experiences led me, or maybe I, sh I should just say that my dad was a, he gave me three things that he was. He was a business executive. He, he worked for General Motors. He was a musician and he taught public speaking. And I would say that he was passionate about all three. And he made me, I would say he made me, but he gave me the opportunity so I became a business executive, growing companies around the globe. I became a musician, and I became an instructor. Hold on, hold on. I didn't know you made music. You want you want to spit a sixteen? No, you know on my podcast, I ask every guest to rap at the end of it, and my my first guest was an illustrious rap star as well. So I actually didn't know that about you. You got something for the people? <laughs> I don't think I have anything that would be of interest particularly today, but uh, I had. What he, you know, he, he was interesting. So he was, when he was in his, uh, I guess he was a teenager, right? He and his brother were, what do you call, uh, identical twins. And they both played the trumpet. And they grew up in Flint, Michigan. Uh, they went to New York to start a career. And they were kind of taken for a short period of time because then the war started, World War II, and they had to go into the war. But for a time, they were very popular because they were identical twins playing the trumpet together. So they had a gig. And uh, then my dad also played the piano much better than I do because he played uh, by ear. So you could say, dad, play this song. He could sit down and play it for you. I mean, that, that's, uh, that blows my mind, that, that skill. But anyway, he gave me those three things. So he trained me as a kid in being a public speaker. So then when I got uh, I learned a million things from Ronald Reagan, the great communicator. I knew I had to start imparting this skill to other people. And this is my third book, which you see behind me, Winning Your Audience. This is a number one bestseller, Amazon number one bestseller. So people are just grabbing it off the shelves because speaking is empowerment. Speaking is empowerment, but it has to be done in the right way. Because a lot of speaking is done uh, through anger. A lot of speaking is done through ignorance. A lot of speaking is done in ways that it's not going to be received by the audience. So why waste your time? So in this book, uh, some of the great examples I have, and this book is filled with how do I do it? How do I do it? How do I create a bridge to my audience? How do I, uh, what's the architecture of a great speech? But I use examples like Frederick Douglass, for example. Now, Frederick Douglass is one of my, everyone's an incredible hero, right? So Frederick Douglass, he actually found freedom and liberty through speaking. And he was such uh, an authentic person that when he, he was speaking, you know, all over the East Coast, and of course became a, a close personal friend of President Lincoln. But in his speaking, he had such authenticity. We talk about Dr. King, why, why, why is his message resonate? You know why? Because he loved. He was a man of love. He loved his audience. He loved the people that he was talking to. And in his mountaintop speech, you know, he, he elevates the discourse. He doesn't bring it down. He elevates it. And do you know something? This is what Ronald Reagan exemplified, I think, so well. Ronald Reagan knew that when you tell people they're good, they respond much better than telling people, man, you are a trouble, dude. You are, you know, you, you are, you're messed up, okay? Ronald Reagan would tell you, you're made in the image and likeness of God. You have everything to look forward to. You have a life that you, you can determine for yourself. You are good. God made you that way. And that's the way Ronald Reagan taught, and that's exactly the way Dr. King taught. And that's why it resonated, and that's why these people are known as great preachers and great speakers. Ronald Reagan was going to go to divinity school. He was going to become a preacher. 
I say that if he had, he might have ministered to thousands, maybe in a lifetime. He became an evangelist to millions of people because his voice and his message were heard around the world. That is his durable and lasting legacy, what he did for the rest of the world. But he wanted everyone to be free. But Michael, the reason he wanted them to be free and free of the encumbrances of government telling you what to do at all times, because if you begin to worship the government, you have to give something else up. That would be the worship of God. And the worship of God is the only thing that's going to give you freedom. And Ronald Reagan knew that. So he wanted people to be free to worship God because he knew that was the primary relationship that we have in life. Our primary relationship is with God. And that, that's what he knew and that's what Dr. King knew. That's why what they say, what they said, resonates so much today. We need more people talking like this, Michael. We need more people telling the world, you're good. You're not limited. You're not bad. You're, you're, you know, you're, you're not a criminal. You, you have all the f fundamental rights that God gave you. Now rise up and, as, and take, take that uh, mantle of freedom and responsibility, which are, have to be combined, and go forward with that. That's what these speakers knew, and that's what they imparted to people. And that is why they had such, going back to this, impact. Right, man, you uh, you hit on a lot. I wanna, I wanna take it back. I wanna take it back and ask a question. So, if those people hadn't stormed that office with those automatic weapons and fired those shots, does your position get created? Does your superior at your workplace ask you that question? How do we measure how effective we are being in the community? Isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? So our life is a series of vignettes, which we build on, and our life is a divine design. It's not a human design. God is putting us into, if we're listening, you know, God is putting us into, giving us opportunities. If we're listening and we're alert, and this is not anything. Now, that was that anything that I could have planned? You know, when I went in the White House, I went in in another role, representing the president to the business community. And one day, he was like, uh, you know, we're going to start this initiative, and I think that we, we could contract with an outside organization, like a nonprofit, to start this impact investing and philanthropy program. And uh, so, oh, okay. And then, then they said, well, wait a minute, maybe you should run it inside. Well, they didn't know, they didn't necessarily know what happened that day that those gunmen took, uh, our, took us hostage in, in, you know, 10 years before that. They didn't know that story, but it's a developing, every person's life is a developing story. And it's a question of, are you going to leave behind a, a mess, a, a trail of, of distraught people and, and, uh, you know, communities, uh, are, are you going to leave behind a trail of good in what you've done for the world, for your community, for your family, for yourself? So I would say that to answer your question, would it have ever happened? I can't answer that question. Maybe other things would have happened, but I will tell you this, that the man who was the son of the founder of General Motors, who was my boss, he was, and he was the president of, of his family's foundation, which is significant. Now it's, it has billions of dollars now that, uh, in, in assets, right? So it's a, it's a major foundation. And he was a wonderful person, but not particularly on fire about anything. I want to tell you something. After that happened, and he had to be thrown in a safe, a room-sized safe, like a room, it's a safe. I don't know if you've ever seen one of these. You know, and it's, it's, got a, it's got a big lock on it, right? Right. So that's where he was thrown to be safe from these terrorists, right? So he was protected. The rest of it, there were no killings or death or anything like that. But so he comes out of that safe. You know, I'm just thinking about this. Do, do you ever know in the Bible where 
It says, go into your closet and shut the door. Yes, sir, I know that. I know that. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, well, think about this for a minute. That man was thrown into his closet. And what else? Lock the door. Now, Ooh. why is that important? You okay, right. now, wh nah. why is that important? What? Why yeah. is that important? Because you lock out. You lock out all the mess that's going on in the world and you get alone with your thoughts and you get alone with god so he goes in there i don't know what he was thinking or maybe he's probably scared to death i don't know what, what's going on right but he goes in that room and that room is locked so when he comes out guess what he became a new man all of a sudden, he was like on fire. Why do you think he came to me and he asked me to do this? He found God in that closet, brother. Well, he found a new purpose in life. Amen. Okay? And Amen. he, and, and I wrote about this, uh, you know, years later, and, and I contacted, by that time, he might have passed away. I forget when I wrote this first article. So I, I sent it to his daughter, and I said, you know, I don't want to say anything that, you know, he didn't, or I don't want to misrepresent him because to me, this is what happened to him. He, he became alive as a person. He, for the rest of his life, and I invited him to come to the White House when I worked in the White House and everything. And uh, he, he was a, a very special person, but I would say for that period in his life, from that experience on until it ended, he became a person who was much more alive, much more alert, much more fired up about you know, his role in the world. Before that, I don't think he, I think maybe he was wandering a little bit. And so I, I sent it to his daughter. I said, can you, I don't want to say anything that was, was untrue or misrepresents your dad. And she said, no, I, I agree with you. So, so let me go, let me go a little bit deeper. And this is something that I've been contemplating and mulling on with other people that I respect. Uh, and it's, it's a twofold issue. A, the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament. Now we can, essentially distill the God of the New Testament to the love, right? The Jesus just radical revolutionary love. However, in the Old Testament, if we are, if we are honest, and in, even in Revelation uh, a lot as well, we see a lot of warfare, a lot of destruction, a lot of cleansing. And one of the issues of today in which we see is that change is happening However, change is happening as a response to death and violence and even more, uh, even more uncanny than previous eras that violence is being broadcast 24 seven on social media. And these issues in terms of civilians and police and, and the brutality being endured is finally getting experienced by people of all colors that are now joining this march. And I, I've really been coming to grips with American history. We've had this conversation you know, in a smaller degree, but is it possible to have revolution or systemic change without bloodshed? Well, I, I don't know, of course, uh, bloodshed was the loss of lives in the Civil War was absolutely mind-boggling. So there was a tremendous loss of life uh, to defeat slavery at that time. But, you know, I have to say this, though, and Dr. King says this as well, that you can have a bloody war and you can have protests and there's no question that the example I just gave you of this man changing his life, turning right. his life around because of violence, uh, that sometimes these things have to occur to, to shake us up and make us confront right. ourselves. Even, uh, pardon me, even Dr. King getting killed as well, right? It's people that we respect, the George Floyd getting killed and Ahmaud Arbery and, and, and the list goes on. I know. I, I don't think that I was reading something this morning that Tolstoy says. Um, he said, we always talk about changing the world, but we rarely talk about changing ourselves. So the real way to bring about change 
is to address our own personal inadequacies, uh, our, our inadequacies, our own personal uh, point of view that may be limiting to ourselves and others, our own uh, racism, our, our own hatred, our, our own, uh, the things that dwell in our heart. Because you can have violence and you can change laws, you can change practices, you can change uh, regulation, but it doesn't mean you've changed a heart. So for example, uh, police officers who have, and they have mandatory um, in-service training every year that they have to go through. You can have all kinds of stuff like that. You can, and it, it is important to have it. And it is important to be much more, we, we have to be, address all of those things, no question. But the fundamental change has to happen within. And there's a massive, I would say particularly today because society is so ego driven, you know, I'm great. I'm, uh, I'm the, you know, you're talking about yourself all the time. People are promoting, you know, self promotion, self aggrandizement, all of the ego, you know, so much of society is ego driven. And you're told, you know, get up in the morning and look in the mirror and say, I can do this. You're, you know, you're great. You're blah, 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 blah. Well, where's the humility or where's the self introspection that says, do I harbor any resentment? Do I harbor any hatred? Do I harbor any uh, conflict? Do I harbor resentment? Do I harbor any of these things in my heart? Because change, the only real change that ever happens is in a person's heart. Mm. How would you, uh, how would you rate the effectiveness, A, of the administration you work with in the White House, and B, of the Christian church, and especially the white evangelical church and grappling with these issues of racial and social justice that we are currently now facing as a nation? Well, that's a massive question you, you asked me. <laughs> so, uh, you know, that would, that would take uh, like a week to, to talk about that. Well, even um, just the solutions, even, even, even in terms of things that you would like to, uh, you would like to see addressed in, in, in order to create that legacy that we both know is, uh, is only possible through the most high. I, I think that bringing people together, uh, I, I think that bringing people together on the basis of respect for what they bring to the table, uh, which oftentimes is very different than what you have. And this has nothing to do with race. It has to do with each individual person comes to the table or to, to a discussion with different backgrounds, different viewpoints. One of the things I talk about in my book, Michael, th and this is absolutely critical. This is absolutely fundamental and so important for people to get. When you say something and I listen, I'm hearing it according to the filter right. in my mind, heart and soul. People right. don't get that. They think that if you look at a person and you say, uh, you know, I want a job or uh, I, I or, if, or if anyone's giving a, you know, they're standing up and they're toppling a statue or they're just, you know, sitting in your living room and they're making, you know, sharing some kind of conversation. The way you hear it is different than the way the person who's speaking it thinks you hear it. You follow me? Yes, sir. Now, this is the only people have to recognize this because you have to, to be an effective communicator, you have to force your way into the hearts of these other people. Now, I'm gonna tell you a little story. So I, I took Nancy Reagan to, we went to a uh, drug abuse <clears throat> center graduation and there were thousands of people, right? It was a massive gymnasium and there were kids, all races, you know, on, on one side, they had gone through drug rehab and the parents or the guardians or, you know, family is on the other side. And then there was the, the person who had the head of the drug rehab center in the middle and he would read off a kid's name and they, they would say, you are, you know, you're clean. You graduated from the program. 
you get to go home. And the kid ran toward, and the parent ran toward the center of the room, collapsed in each other's arms. Everyone in the entire massive auditorium, this went on for like three, three and a half hours. Everyone was crying. The Secret Service was crying. They don't cry, Secret Service. They're not allowed to cry. Right. The White House press corps, they were crying, right? Now, some of the students didn't get to go home because they were not clean, right? They had to stay in the program. Right. So we're sitting there. I'm sitting next to First Lady Nancy Reagan, and she had these prepared remarks that she was supposed to give at the end, right? And after going through that whole thing for three and a half hours, she and I looked at each other, and we took those speech remarks, those written remarks. You know what we did? Rip it. How could you stand up and give some kind of, you know, read a speech right. after you've been through that? Okay? So she goes to the center of the, this massive gymnasium. She takes a mic in her hand, and she turns to the parents, talks to them, turns to the kids. You know what she's saying? What's she saying? I love you. I know the pain in your heart. I know what you, this is tied to the parent. I know what you've gone through. Parents, family, grandmother, you know, whatever it is, right? Then she turns to the kids. I love you. I'm here to support you. You have great life ahead of you. I'm so proud of you for the work you've done and the work you're going to continue to do to get clean. I'm so, okay. This was her listening to their pain. And you know what they, the White House press corps, they said to me, dude, what happened to this woman tonight? Don't ever forget this. They said, what, hap what happened to her tonight? We thought she was just a, you know, plastic person. Right. Okay. So in the motorcade on the way back to the hotel that night, I told her one of my favorite sayings. Whenever the heart speaks, no matter how simple the words, they are always acceptable to those who have hearts. This is what we have to learn. We have to meet our audience where they are and the pain that they're feeling. And when we do, and you, you see today, it, I, I'm so amazed and, and so impressed and grateful for so many people who stand up and really pour out their heart. That is what is going to really make a difference, is to pour out your heart in a way that can be understood by the people who are listening. That is one of the most valuable things that I can teach you or coach you, or you can learn from me reading this book. There's a, there's a sign uh, very close to me, a big sign, uh, many, many stories tall, that says America is too great for small dreams. And I would love to ask you, of course, that's a President Reagan quote, What's your biggest dream for this country, this world, and, and the kingdom to which you serve? I think my biggest dream is that it continues to live free. And it is a country that offers freedom and possibility and continues to serve as the light of the world. Because I can tell you, and this is what I'm so afraid of, Michael, that if our world, if our country descends into a country of socialism, governed with people's lives governed by the state, the light of individual opportunity and freedom, which this country bears, imperfect as it is, better than any other country, the rest of the world will go into chaos. God has put this country into the hands of people who can determine, President Reagan said, remember freedom is only, we're only one generation from losing freedom. Every generation has to fight to make sure that every life, every person in America has the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness and guaranteed by our constitution. As I say, we're still working it out. 
But I'm telling you, the people in Venezuela don't have any opportunity to work it out. The people in Russia don't have any opportunity to work it out. The people in China don't have any opportunity to work it out. We are the light that's been placed here for the world. That's what Ronald Reagan truly believed. And he, you know, he, he had this in, incredible way of using metaphors to talk about more uh, concepts that were perhaps more difficult to understand. But if you take this metaphor of the light of America, and again, as imperfect as it is, we're all working toward improving. But the fundamental, the fundamental truth of America is based on freedom for everyone. And I can't say that there's any other country that has a constitution that's really built on principles. Most countries, you know, most countries are built on dynasties or they're, they're built on, uh, they're built on territory uh, that's been divided up or they're built on language. America has, is built on precepts and principles. And we need to come together to improve. Every generation needs to improve on the practice of those principles. But we need to be free and unfettered from the control of government. In individual, we have to have individual rights to be able to pursue happiness in this country, unencumbered by other people telling us what to do. Of course, we have to have laws. We have to have justice. We have to have a, a, a structure, a federalist structure that uh, keeps the peace. There's no question. But we all need to be working toward the improvement of this ideal. Got it, got it. I hear a lot about uh, you. You really, you really believe in America. Now, my question to you, and and and, and this will be my last. What do you say to people who, even like myself, feel like America has yet to really belong to me in a sense to which many, many people and whether they admit it or not, and, and, and I've just worked up the courage to admit it, I feel like much of my life I've lived as a second class citizen. And even though I've been uh, able to experience some of the greatest aspects of America, and, and quite frankly, I'm, I'm often the only person that looks like me in a lot of the rooms that I go to, uh, I also know that uh, simple things, I, such as driving down the street, uh, I have to fight in order to keep my mind high enough and be prepared for certain inevitabilities from which my life can be threatened for arbitrary reasons and factors antithetical to the purposes of America. So, you know, we've had enough, you know, convos and I've seen enough of the world and experienced enough great things you know, but me or any other extremely successful African Americans, you're hearing, you know, some of the most influential guys, the, the billionaires, even the Robert Smith, the, Rob, the Bob Johnson, say that, you know, I've been through things that you can't even imagine, and, and that are only inflicted upon me for my race. So, what do you say to the the tens of millions of Americans that feel like they have yet to experience the America that you love and that you speak so passionately about? Ronald Reagan said, America's best days are still ahead. Ooh. So I would say. I like I, that. <laughs> I get it. I get, I get what you're, you're saying only in the way that I can. Right. But I, I haven't, I haven't experienced all the things that you just mentioned. But that doesn't mean I can't love you for or, or understand you for what you have gone through or in what you're, you continue to go through. But isn't life, isn't that what life is about? You know, other people may struggle with other kinds of things, uh, but th there's no question that uh, these are things that the light and the structure and the gift of America to the world is the only structure that is ever going to 
bring about a situation where you don't feel unsafe driving down the street and you don't feel like you're the only person in the room that looks the way you do. That is something that you and I have to join hands together and be dedicated to achieving. But I can tell you one thing for sure, the people in this country who want to turn it into a socialist country that is controlled by the state, which means basically controlled by what they think, will never get us there. That will never get us there. It is by taking, taking up the reins of responsibility based on our, our constitutional rights and our constitutional structure of government and just confronting these evils and confronting these ills one by one, person by person, addressing them in an impactful way and every day just making as much progress as you can. You know, I, I remember someone saying to me, well, a leader is just a person who's had a lot of troubles and has confronted them and used them as stepping, stepping stones. You, you think people that are leaders or wealthy or their heads of companies or whatever, you think they haven't suffered in their own way? I'm not comparing them to you, but I'm just saying, you know, you mentioned some uh, African-American leaders there. Everyone suffers in some way, but it's a question of whether you use the things you suffer to climb up and out of. Now, there's no question that systemic issues in communities, in all kinds of institutions need to be addressed. But Michael, how can they be addressed? How can they be addressed? They can only be addressed by what's in your heart. You can only, a system or form of government or a structure is only as good as the people who run it and manage it. Because you can take any, any form of regulation or any, any form of, of, of uh, you know, bureaucracy and you can corrupt it. We have a lot of examples of that, okay? You can, you can turn it into, you know, use it for your own political purposes. It's only as good as the people, Amen. as the hearts of those people. And so I'm saying that what I'm looking for is in a call for individual reformation. Isn't that really what our nation needs? A call for individual reformation. That's why Dr. King, and you know, I had the great honor of working for the Martin Luther King Foundation. Did you see the Joe Osteen, John Gray interview? No. So Joe Osteen, who obviously you know is uh, one of America's foremost pastors at oh, Lake. Yeah, I know him. Yeah. Yeah, in, in Houston, but one of his uh, one of his mentees, John Gray, who is the lead pastor of Relentless Church in Greenville, South Carolina. They had a uh, they had an amazing discussion, and you've seen I've seen a lot of pastors like Stephen Furtick from Elevation and TD Jakes. It's just these multicultural conversations about the role of the church leading forward in 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 ways us as us as equity holders in the kingdom of in the kingdom of God and followers of the way our fiduciary obligation so to speak to rid of this institutional racism, and I, and I brought that up because. The way in which that inspired me, uh, I could feel like this conversation and us reigniting that hope and flame in America having an impact on on a lot of people. And I've even been hearing people that I look up to greatly that I'll listen to for motivation that have said that they've given up on equality in America. But I'm grateful sincerely for you for bringing me into different realms and I really want us to link arms and go to the next level in terms of ensuring that the America that you really believe in is accessible to so many people that just don't feel that way. Mm -hmm. That being said, uh, you told me once that President Reagan will close out, uh, will start meetings in prayer. And um, I was hoping that you could uh, you could close out this podcast with just a prayer for America and bless uh, bless us. Okay. So prayer 
is not just imploring God to do something. It's a prayer to open our hearts and our thoughts and our minds to acknowledging and feeling that God is the only power. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God is the only judge. Hallelujah. Praise God is the only lawgiver. Praise God. He loves every one of his creatures, every one of his ideas. And he sustains and supports and supplies every one of his children. Every one of his children is precious in his sight. Help us, O oh Lord, to understand this better and to feel the love that God has for everyone. For in feeling that love for others, we feel the love that God has for us. Help to humble us to bring us to our knees, to help us cleanse our own thought in our lives of any judgment, condemnation, ill will, hatred, anger, because we know, God, you have created us to follow you in your paths of peace Amen. and reconciliation. Help us to be forbearing of others, to desire each day to do nothing but to help our brothers and sisters and to carry your light your righteousness and your love through our families, through our lives, through our schools, through our communities, so that everyone will feel this light and care and certainty that you provide you are the maker you have made heaven and earth you are the one we adore you are the one we worship and in worshiping you we obey your law of love amen amen <laughs> I feel, I feel the renewed purpose. Thank you so much. And thank everybody for watching. I appreciate you. All my life. Wanted to be an American legend. Look at me, look at me. American legend. All this time. Wanted to be an American legend. Look at me, look at me. American legend. American legend, American legend. American legend, American legend. American legend, American legend. Wow. American legend, American legend. Wow. My first L25K.